if independence uh, is an external autonomy of some sort and sovereignty is its content, I would argue that one cannot have one without the other. Actually, one shouldn't or don't deserve one without the other. Because what right does any nation have to exist if, it's, if it is or becomes uh, an empty shell? And in that sense, I'd like to refer to, to national sovereignty as much as national independence. Um, it would be impossible, obviously, to, to go through all the threats to our national sovereignty, for there are many. So allow me to mention just a few that I believe are of particular importance. Uh, obviously, these are not new challenges, but I believe that recent events have made them very clear, maybe too clear at this point. As it was mentioned several times yesterday, one of the conclusions that we should draw from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is that when hard times come, it's not NATO, not the EU, but free and independent nation states that take action. Countries which may have, and they do, different national interests and act accordingly. The same happened, by the way, and you just pointed it out, um, by the way, when COVID first hit, it took months for the Commission or the, or the EU institutions in general to articulate any response. So the first challenge we face today, um, which again is obvious, is a very weakened defense capability to face actual or deter potential aggressions, especially when again it is so clear that despite heated moralism, global governance organizations of every sort are not willing to pay the price to help a nation in need. And we should also understand why, for there's a reason. We just don't have the time, nor we want to experiment with a utopian rationalist outlook. Not anymore. Some tried, and for a long time, and they failed. It seems to me that a more sovereignist option that consists of a realistic empirical style approach of governance must be pursued a vision that understands that nations are not moral entities, but agents driven by interests. A new international conservative order is not an option, but a necessity. And let us not think that the liberal order it replaces was ever such a thing. It was hardly inter international, but rather regional. If not, go ask revisionist powers out there. It was hardly orderly, but rather chaotic, and it was hardly liberal, but rather imperialistic, and in doing so, paradoxically illiberal. Secondly, I believe massive illegal immigration is also a threat to nation states for at least two main reasons. First, if there's an influx of illegal immigrants coming in high numbers and speed to Europe, let's speak of Europe, this point, that also helps dissolve national identity and contributes to the purpose of a greater degree of political integration, hence undermining national independence. Allow me to quote here St. Thomas Aquinas, not an extremist of any sort, to illustrate this point. He says, if foreigners were allowed to meddle with the affairs of a nation as soon as they arrive, many dangers might occur since the foreigners not yet having the common good firmly at heart might strive for, cent for cent certain goals in opposition to the people. Note that Aquinas presupposed the existence of something called common goods, which is something that the liberal vision has consistently fought against. Second, illegal immigration is being used today as it has been in the past across history for strategic purposes by third parties, especially other states, to create unrest and produce internal allegiance to the home country, which has a special interest in infiltrating people for a number of reasons. For instance, Lukashenko has been importing immigrants for months now on tourist visas to send them later on to Europe. The result, if he succeeded, would be that Putin would pay the bill if not, the EU would pay him off 
as we already did, so that Turkey would hold immigrants in. Another example is that of my country, Spain. Morocco has consistently practiced these weaponized migration strategies over the years, something that has intensified in the past two years. In 2021 alone, more than 50,000 people crossed illegally Spanish southern border because of Morocco. There were over 20 attempts to climb the fences separating the Spanish cities of Ceuta and Melilla from Morocco. So illegal immigration, of course, certainly poses a threat to national sovereignty. Francesco just mentioned the issue of energy, a field where it is all too clear how when things are tough, again, countries follow their own agenda, as they've always done, despite carbon emission reduction talks or green transition initiatives. Right, Germany? I will finish with two final threats that fall under the category of economic warfare and also pose a threat to national independence namely debt and trade. Debt is also of paramount importance. Both its growing number, its growing volume, to fund irresponsible and ideological, or irresponsible because of being ideological, public spending, and also because of who is it that holds it. Spain, for instance, already has 120% debt to GDP ratio, which with these levels of debt, sovereignty crumbles for obvious reasons. Just as we cannot outsource our defense or our security to third parties, we should stop borrowing money from those who at least, or to say the least, don't have our best interest at heart. China, for instance, as you know all too well, holds 1.1 trillion dollars of US debt. That's roughly 20% of it. Now, that severely harms any nation's uh, independence. The same would apply to trade. China is today a top trade partner of the entire EU and also the US. Sometimes conservatives, we are criticized or branded as protectionist. I would argue that this is not the case. We are just not stupid. And with massive trade partners that don't, don't follow, they just don't, the rules of the game, I'm afraid that we can either have free markets or free trade, but not both. So in conclusions, we should be watchful of our security and defense capabilities to protect borders and peoples. And we should also take a look at who we owe money to and who we trade with, because that too affects national independence. It seems clear to me, as many have said before these days, that the brotherhood of free and independent states that share a number of values such as love of country, the importance of virtue, and the idea of objective truth is a much more honest and also a more pragmatic way of arranging cooperation internationally while retaining that which we should protect fiercely and passionately as the Ukrainian people are doing these days, setting an example for us all, our right to exist, our national sovereignty. Thank you very much.